we will begin with the first session. The first session today is called Why the Ocean? This important opening session will explore the relevance of the ocean and ocean-related environmental issues. The changes in the ocean and the Anthropocene will be explored and discussed. The moderator for this session will be Marisa Lopez, mentor at Pop Oceans and founder of Bluer Future. The speakers for this session include Her Excellency Dr. Amina Gurib Fakim, former president of Mauritius. Dr. Mina has served as professor, dean of faculty, and pro-vice chancellor at the University of Mauritius. She has also co-authored more than 30 books, book chapters, and scientific articles, is the recipient of five honorary doctorates, and has received numerous international honors and prizes. Also, His Excellency Jose Manuel Barroso who is the former president of the European Commission and has served as Prime Minister of Portugal. He is currently visiting a prof as professor at, Cath at the Catholic University of Portugal and the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies in Geneva. And finally, our two youth speakers, Caroline and Lauren Sandberg, who join us from the Sierra Nevada. They're both students at Toho Expedition Academy and leaders of the Eco Leaders and the Earth Warriors Environmental Club. Marisa, I invite you to please start the session. Thank you, Summer. We're so excited to have everybody here and you have these fantastic speakers. So thanks everybody for joining us. Um, we are going to start with this question, why the ocean? Uh, this is our opening session and we really are excited to have our speakers here to help us explore, explore what is really the relevance of the ocean right now in this era that we're in when we have a lot of conflicting priorities that we have to address in this world. There is a lot that we need to deal with right now. So why should the ocean be front of mind today and every day? And so um, her accent. Amina, we're going to ask you to please open the session. We're very happy to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us um, on this beautiful day. I will let you take the mic. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can you hear me well? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, excellencies, distinguished guests, young people, thank you very much for associating with this event. And I will have a particular word of thanks for Ash Pachori. Shanali and of course the entire pop movement for associating with this very, very important event, which is of course celebrating today our ocean. So ladies and gentlemen, I grew up on an island and from a very young age, I had learned to appreciate the magic of the oceans and also how it inspires fear and respect. Our ocean's vastness presents another threat. We don't know the depth of the ocean in the course of a day, we don't see the effects of climate change every single day. We just see this great big ocean and we wrongly assume that it's too big to be wrecked. It's easy as a consequence to diminish the urgency of the challenge. Yet we know that climate change and pollution are damaging our environment and the oceans. I find it unacceptable that the magic of a pristine ocean that I enjoyed as a child might no longer be transmitted to the next generation. These challenges that the oceans face demand collective action and deserves the world attention. It will be a recognition of the reality that the ocean's health is our health. And if we agree that the oceans connect us all, they will, by corollary, affect us all. Oceans are home to millions across the world and provide food and nutrition for more than a billion people. My small island country, Mauritius, is located in the Southwest Indian Ocean, the world's third largest oceanic division. Since time immemorial, the lives, livelihood, and traditions of Mauritians have been inextricably linked to the ocean. For us, the ocean economy and the national economy are indistinguishable. So the investment we make today in terms of advocacies, policies and resource will not only serve our economy, our well-being, but will also be critical to our foreign policy and our security and is vital to who we are as a race. Ladies and gentlemen, dangerous changes in our climate caused in the age of the Anthropocene, dead zones in our oceans caused again by man-made pollution, 
unsustainable fishing practices, unprotected marine areas used to be home to rare species and entire ecosystems are putting at risk our own livelihoods. The health of the oceans will define in large part our health and the health of our economies. So how we treat our oceans is a burden as the oceans feed us, protect us, regulate our climate, our weather, anchor industries for transportation to tourism to trade of all kind. Our conservation efforts and our obligations to combat climate change go hand in hand because marine areas already have to cope with overfishing and ship traffic and pollution from both macro and microplastics. Our oceans act like sponges, absorbing most of the extra heat caused by global warming greenhouse gases, which are our common enemy, as they are the cause of the oceans falling oxygen levels and the rising level of acidity. Both trends are changing the chemistry exacerbating and stressing life under the waves. Our escalating greenhouse gas emissions are the cause of the warming of the ocean, by which coral is bleached, ecosystems lost, extreme weather events fomented, and sea level made to rise ever upwards. As oceans warm and sea levels rise, our lives and livelihoods are likely to be changed too. Home will become uninhabitable. Floods will increasingly devastate communities, crops will wither, and industries like fishing disrupted having rippling effects on the food chain. Cultures that have coexisted with the ocean for millennia are forced to flee to higher grounds and over the years will be threatened with extinction. The more of these threats that we eliminate through conservation, the more resilient those ecosystems will be to the consequences of climate change. Ladies and gentlemen, recognizing the fragility of these ecosystems, the UN has dedicated SDG 14, setting out a series of targets aimed at conserving and sustainably using the ocean resources. We will need a compass to guide our recovery course, and we have a reliable one in the form of 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda, coupled with the Paris Climate Agreement. Through these, we can ensure that short-term recovery solutions are in, in accord with long-term development and climate action objectives. The vision of a blue-green post-pandemic recovery fully accepts the priorities of fostering economic development and creating employment, at the same time promoting greater social equity and welfare. In the energy sectors, tradition, Transition to renewables, for example, it foresees innovative energy storage, the installation of flexible power grids, electric vehicle charging systems, green hydrogen, and multiple other energy development technologies. All of these will mean jobs, jobs, and more jobs. The blue-green recovery road will take us through economic weight stations and environmental agreements that will bring human systems and natural systems into a new harmony based on respect and balance. This must surely be the hallmark of any forthcoming UN Ocean Treaty Conference on Biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction, so that we will soon live in a world in which at least 30% of the ocean out to the 70% outside of natural jurisdiction is protected under effective and well-managed conservation measures. Ladies and gentlemen, Think only of the fact that every second breath you take comes from the ocean. You will find good reason to welcome that prospect. We have already known that humans and nature are part of one connected system, with nature providing us with our basic needs and much more. Yet, lately, we have been riding over nature's benefit roughshod, taking too much for granted, disguising greed in our finest costume of profit and progress. On the blue-green recovery road, we will set out to put that right. We will move from linear exploitation of finite plant resources into a sustainable era of circular economies. We will advance into sustainable food systems, resilient cities, and rapid transition into renewable energy systems. And we will safeguard the biodiversity of nature upon which our lives ultimately depend. In the interest of the ocean's health, when we say we will plant a trillion trees, yet science has shown us 
how a healthy plankton population can easily surpass these trillion trees. Still, we must include the restoration of mangroves, seagrass, and kelp in the knowledge that they sequester four times more carbon than their terrestrial cousins. Blue-green recovery foresees an end to the unconscionable levels of pollution and waste for which we have of late been responsible. It demands an end to harmful subsidies distorting such sectors as oil, gas, and fisheries. It demands an end to the international scandals of illegal fishing, overfishing, and modern slavery at sea. When it, what it expects of government around the world is to look beyond the short term and put in place equitable policies, investment decisions that are in harmony with a sustainable future. In the long run, the survival of our kind may be intrinsically linked to the fate of corals. Thus, the course of blue-green recovery must steer us well away from the dreaded territory of 1.5 to 2 degree centigrade global warming. So ladies and gentlemen, if we care about the legacy that we will leave our children, we will have to act boldly. And now, as it becomes increasingly clear that we cannot seriously protect our planet without protecting our oceans. If we love our children and theirs, if we love this planet, and if you love life itself, then staying true to that course is the ultimate obligation. Sustaining our old ways will but resume a course toward devastating hurricanes, flooding coasts, vast wildfires, proliferation of famines and wars, massive displacement of population, and the recurrence of global pandemics. A blue-green recovery has faith in the genius of our species, our powers of innovation, and our ability to share ideas and resources with empathy in adversity. We must take these currents while they serve us through the sadness, trauma, and the sacrifice that the COVID-19 pandemic has brought upon us. Finally, we must interiorize the saying that we did not inherit the earth from, the parents, from our parents, but we borrowed it from our grandchildren. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Amina. That was amazing. Yes, that was beautiful. And you have so many really important points. I mean, the, ocean, the health of the ocean is instricably uh, tied to our own health. So we cannot forget that. Um, we really appreciate that amazing presentation. Um, I am honored now to invite the next speaker, uh, His Excellency Jose Manuel Barroso. Uh, former President, European Commission, and former Prime Minister of Portugal. His Excellency, are you there? I yes. see you and you're unmuted. Thank you so much. Please take the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> it's indeed a pleasure for me to participate in this Protect, Protect Our Planet Ocean Virtual Summit, also to mark the World Oceans Day. This is a, a topic that is very close to my heart. I've been working on this matter while I was prime minister and also of my country, Portugal, but also in the European Commission. I was mainly focused on issues of governance of the oceans and also sustainability. And so I would like to share some of these considerations with you today, namely from a political and policy-making perspective, focusing also on Europe, but not only uh, on Europe. But let me start by paying tribute to the late Dr. Pachauri that unfortunately left us some time ago. Uh, I know how committed he was to the agenda for sustainability and also the fight against climate change. And I'm sure that uh, he will be proud to see his son and all of us today going on with this fight against climate change and for sustainability. So the oceans hold a key uh, to the future. They offer great potential for boosting growth, while they play a key role in regulating the climate system. But they are under threat from over-exploitation, climate change, acidification, pollution, and declining biodiversity. And there are also very serious uh, and worrying uh, issues of security and safety, various forms of crime uh, in the sea, from illegal fishing to illegal trafficking, including the trafficking 
trafficking of human beings to piracy. And there are also increased geopolitical tensions, namely because of attempts to assert territorial or maritime claims outside of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. So oceans are at the same time a space of opportunity and hope, but let's be frank, also they are a space of danger and also uh, of anxiety because they are critically important for the future of our planet, but we are not sure about the very future of the ocean. This future of the oceans and its stability will have a major impact on our planet, our planet that we call Earth, but in fact we could better call it water, since uh, as we know 70% of our planet is indeed covered by water. Curiously, uh, that is also more or less the part of water that a human being has when he's born. It's around 70% of water. And the issues that we are going to discuss in this summit, from the need to urgently reduce plastic pollution, to implement solutions for sustainable fishing and tourism, to address ocean acidification, to limit the sea level rise, all of those issues, of course, should be put under the framework of the United Nations guidelines, namely United Nations 230 Agenda for Sustainable Development and SDG Goal 14. That simply says, but that's very powerful at the same time, the goal is to conserve and sustainable um, use the oceans, sea and marine resources. Now, as I said, I was very committed to the issue of governance. And in fact, in uh, 2007, as president of the European Commission, I launched the European Integrated Maritime Policy. In fact, already in 2004, when I assumed office, I thought it would make sense to a commissioner fully dedicated to maritime policy and not only to fisheries, as it was in the past, so that we could build also on the experience of countries in setting a maritime strategy and uh, form a European policy in this field. In fact, as Prime Minister of Portugal, I also created the Portuguese maritime uh, integrated policy at the government level. I'm very proud of the early leadership uh, which the European Commission has shown in this increasingly important sector. Uh, and I'm also very um, motivated to see the ownership of our countries uh, about this policy. And we are now seeing that they are really committed to it. Uh, of course, not, not everything is perfect in Europe, not at all. But I think it's fair to say that the European Union has done a lot to push uh, this agenda not only the agenda of an integrated maritime policy, but also of real growth. And in fact, it was after the European Commission um, document of 2007 um, that we uh, were able, in the Lima Sol conference in 2012, to have an agreement of all the member states, not only on this integrated maritime policy, but also on the so-called blue growth that now is accepted and considered policy uh, for the European Union. So in our document in 2007, we said that the seas are trade routes, climate regulator, source of food, energy and resources, and uh, also a favorite site for citizens, residents and recreation. And the commission proposed an integrated maritime policy based on the European Union, based on the re clear recognition that all matters related to Europe's oceans and seas are interlinked, and that sea-related policies must develop in a joint up way if we are to reap the desired results. So the integrated maritime policy seeks to provide a coherent approach to maritime issues with increased coordination between different policy areas, namely the issue of combining, of course, sustainable growth with respect for the environment and the fight against climate change. The integrated maritime policy focuses on issues that do not fall under a single sector based policy. For instance, blue growth, economic growth based on different maritime sectors, and also issues that require the coordination of different sectors and actors. 
for instance, marine knowledge. Specifically, it covers the following cross-cutting policies. Blue growth, already mentioned, but also marine data and knowledge, maritime special planning, integrated maritime surveillance, and sea basin strategies. And it was also this integrated maritime policy that allowed afterwards uh, the strategy uh, of sustainable blue economy finance. And in fact, we established also with some private foundations a sustainable blue economy finance principles that was done in 2017. So I think we all agree that healthy oceans are essential for humankind as climate regulators, as a source of global food security, as a source of human health, and also as an engine for economic growth. The OECD estimates that ocean-based industries uh, constitute rough, can uh, constitute roughly 2.6 trillion euros in 2030, uh, um, to, and that is the contribution of the ocean economy to the global gross value-added economy. Oceans are also home to a rich and fragile biodiversity, still largely unexplored. Oceans produce half of oxygen of the Earth's atmosphere. They absorb 25% of CO2 emissions. Many islands, including small island developing states and coastal countries, are dependent on marine resources and are vulnerable to the uh, human actions uh, and, uh, that can put in question the conservation and sustainable use of the oceans. And we are also seeing naturally the increase of world population that will also increase the pressure on the ocean, also with the increased competition for raw materials, food, and water, and also increased illegal fishing, piracy, and marine pollution. And of course, that happens also with the threat of climate change. So all these reasons that I presented very, very quickly now are in fact a reason for an effective international ocean governance. And the commission that was already after my leadership in the commission, but of course in the good continuation of our goals, introduced it in uh, 2016 together with the high representative of the European Union, a, a strategy or a communication for international uh, ocean governance. And I insist on that matter that I'd like to focus on this today, um, knowing that other speakers are going to speak about other matters. This international ocean governance is about managing oceans and using their resources in a way that keeps oceans healthy, productive, safe, secure, and resilient. The reality is today around 64% of the oceans, according to the European experts, around 64% of the oceans are outside the border of national jurisdiction. But it's true that there is, under the overall arching United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea, a plethora of jurisdictional rights, institutions, and specific frameworks that have been set up to organize the use of oceans. But there are problems of coordination, of implementation, of enforcement, overlapping, and many gaps. So we need to address this issue. That's why the European Union uh, has put forward that strategy for our world's oceans with three priority areas and uh, many, many sets of actions. Let me just mention the three most important priority areas. First of all, improving institutional framework. Second, the sustainable management to reduce the human impact on the oceans. And third, investing in knowledge and data for the ocean. So very briefly on the improving the institutional framework, it's about rules for the seas that work for all. To ensure rules are properly implemented and that any regulatory gaps are filled. For instance, a covering gaps in the current United Nations framework and more to protect biodiversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction. On sustainable management to reduce human impact, the European Union announced a step up work with international partners to agree on joint action to mitigate climate change and restore marine and coastal systems. Uh, on investing in knowledge and data for the ocean, uh, namely protecting the fish stocks for the future, the European Union agreed to fight illegal 
unreported and, and uh, um, um, unreported fishing, uh, and the European Union has already been applying both electronic tools to monitor vessels and also market mechanisms for traceability. And it is increasing the supervision of its fishing fleet uh, abroad. It will also uh, promote uh, international action to identify vessels wherever they operate. Uh, because, as we know, at least 15% of catches worldwide are estimated to be illegal. Towards there are many other sectors of actions, I will not go into detail, working together for the, for the oceans, the national and parks, namely planning of sea space on a global level uh, by 2025. Uh, that's a very interesting idea of the national ocean parks that are being developed. The safety and security of uh, high seas, many initiatives that have been taken by Grace, some of them quite successfully, namely in the East side of Africa, and also mapping the deep, uh, namely building on the success of the European Union Blue Data Network. That uh, is a, a co cooperation of more than 100 research institutions that share uh, information on an open platform about this uh, blue uh, data. Now, and there is a specific issue, and I like to conclude with a very specific point, because I think it's uh, sometimes better to have a specific conclusion on plastic. The European Union is now considering to have a European Union-wide plastic tax, also because being of own resource for the future of the, um, of the financial perspectives, the European Union budget for the next seven years. There is a discussion that's not yet agreed, but I think it's time for the European Union to agree on that tax on plastic. And then I just want to share with you something I've read recently. It's a book uh, about sea power, so about geopolitics by a retired American admiral, James Stavridis, a brilliant, let's say, military commander. He was supreme allied commander of global operations at NATO. But let me share with you what he said. It was, he found out in 1981, when uh, he was living five years at sea on a destroyer and aircraft career, and he became, uh, he came to the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. He said the following, and he, said, he was very candidly. Beginning with, and now I quote, beginning with my graduation from Annapolis, where we never studied or thought about the environment in any of my classes, this was 1981, I reported to my ships and blissfully watched our engineers pump dirty bulk water full of black oil over the side with impunity. We had dumped completely uninspected garbage into the oceans within visual distance of the coasts. And we have filled the oceans with plastic, toxins, medical waste, slightly radio radioactive materials, and all manner of utterly unsafe products. I certainly did think of myself as a global lawbreaker. Everything I just mentioned was normal underway operations. If I thought about it at all, I would have reflected that the oceans are a huge place. They seem to be able to regenerate themselves. And nothing we were doing was anything other than the way we always did it. End of quote. So today, uh, Admiral uh, Stavridis, I want to make it clear, is an advocate against climate change and for sustainability, but it shows what was the mentality in 81 and what is still the mentality today in some sectors. So I think if we want to make a concrete progress, no. namely the Union, we should now fight this plastic pollution, and not only plastic pollution, and give concrete examples that we can, in practical terms, achieve some results, while we keep in mind, of course, our overarching goals. I thank you very much for your attention, and I wish all the success to this summit. Thank you so much, His Excellency. That was really fantastic. I actually just learned a lot and I appreciate everything you said. Uh, a couple things that jumped out to me. Thank you for mentioning small island developing states. It's really important that we acknowledge them and their role along with other co coastal communities. 
Um, thank you for talking about international coastal government. So important. And I didn't know about the tax on plastic. So that learned a lot myself and I'm sure everyone did. And there's been some questions rolling in the chat that we would like to bounce back to you during the Q&A session uh, later today. So really appreciate your presentation. And I would like to uh, now invite our youth speakers for session one. Uh, to join. Uh, so this is Caroline and Lauren Sandberg. Uh, thank you so much. You will both uh, combined have five minutes for your presentation. Thank you so much for having us today. We're very excited to be speaking here. Um, my name is Caroline Sandberg and this is my sister Lauren and we live in Lake Tahoe near California. Two years ago I co-founded an environmental club at my school um, with my friend Summer who's the MC today. In our club, we started out by brainstorming projects we could work on, and consistently we kept coming across this one prominent issue of single-use plastics in restaurants. We live in a small ski town, and so, and there's tons of tourists that come up every year, and so the restaurants are a huge industry, and the plastics in the restaurants are a big problem. We decided to start a, a group called the Eco Eaters, which is a youth-led organization to help restaurants reduce their single-use plastics and replace them with a recyclable or a compostable option. Our group soon expanded outside of school and my sister joined us. And we've had one main success so far, which is we have um, had, there's a Thai restaurant in our town which we have helped convert from um, styrofoam takeout boxes to a compostable takeout box instead. And we've also had lots of smaller successes um, where we've talked to lots of restaurants in our area as well, and they've all um, got on board with us. And summer, we're going to help them um, with our like we're going to help them change over to a more compostable option, like we did the Thai restaurant. So this was a smaller success; it's still a start, and we're very excited to keep going. Um, other success or other pro or groups that we've worked with is we've placed in a nationwide award for our project and we've spoken at two international conferences about it. At the most recent international conference, the World Sustainable Development Forum, we joined Pop Oceans and that's why we're speaking here today. Yeah, um, at first it might not seem that our project even relates to the ocean, but in fact they can be very intertwined. Eco Eaters aims to eliminate single-use plastics in restaurants and plastic pollution is a huge problem not just in the whole world but in our world's oceans specifically. About 8 million tons of plastic goes into the ocean every year, which is the same as placing five garbage bags of trash on every foot of coastline of our planet. This means that not one square mile of surface ocean anywhere on Earth is free of plastic pollution. You might be wondering how plastic even ends up in the ocean in the first place, especially from somewhere that is far inland, like where we live in the mountains. But even if you live hundreds of miles away from the coast, the plastic you throw away could end up in the ocean. And once the plastic is in the ocean, it decomposes very slowly. It breaks down into tiny pieces called microplastics, which can really harm and even kill sea life. There are three main ways that the plastic we use daily ends up in the seas. And the first one is simply throwing plastic into the garbage when it could be recycled. The plastic you throw away in a bin goes to a landfill. And when this garbage is being transported to the landfill, the plastic is often blown away because it is so lightweight. From there, it can eventually clutter around drains, enter rivers, and then eventually the oceans. The second main way is littering, which is perhaps the most obvious because litter on beaches is easily washed into the oceans. But litter on the street doesn't stay there either. Rainwater and wind can carry the plastic waste into streams and rivers, through drains, and then those drains lead to the oceans. The third main one is products that go down the drains. And I think that this is one that people don't really consider all the time because it's not as obvious. Many of the products that we use daily are flushed down toilets, including wet wipes and cotton buds. Even washing our clothes in the washing machine can be harmful because microfibers are released into water, waterways, and these microfibers are too small to be filled, filtered out by wastewater plants. They end up being eaten by small marine species, and then they can eventually end up even in our food chain. So whether we mean to litter or not, there's always the chance that the plastic we throw away could make it into the sea. So as you can see from the mountains, we're trying to reduce single-use plastics that can go in the ocean. This means that from any part of the world you are, whether it's on the oceans or not, you can help reduce pollution in our oceans. Also at any age, you can make a difference. The youth are the ones that will suffer the consequences 
um, from unhealthy actions, but plastic harms all of us. Big, big changes start with small steps. So even if you're simply just reducing your own single-use plastics at home or signing petitions or voting for the right people, this can have a global impact overall. Thank you so much for having us here today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carolyn and Lauren. That was such a great presentation. Thank you for sharing your project. And you are right. Everyone and anyone can make a difference. This is our world. This is all of our world. So we all have to jump in and do what we can and not wait for somebody else to do it. So I think that's a really, if anything, that's an incredibly important point. So I want to just genuinely thank all the speakers from session one, why is why the ocean, uh, Your Excellency Amin, Your Excellency uh, Jose Manuel Barroso, Caroline and Lauren Sandberg. This has been a fantastic session. I've certainly learned a lot and I know everyone else has. And we have some really amazing questions coming in the Q&A that we have noted to answer later. So thank you very much. With that, I will give the, um, the presentation back to Summer. Summer? Thank you, Marisa. And all of our distinguished speakers as well. It's so great to hear how many different perspectives are represented today.